My name is Forrest Carpenter. I am the one of the engineering managers with Piston Cloud Computing. Uh, and this talk, in case you wandered into the wrong room, is called Upgrading a Place from Grizzly to Ice House, a Cautionary Tale. Uh, there may be some non-zero number of you out there who are thinking this shouldn't even have been an issue. You just stay with whatever the latest stable release is, and you never have to worry about this sort of thing. Um, that is a religious war that I don't want to necessarily get into. But there is also a bit of an Easter egg later for those of you who have that opinion, uh, and I will point it out. Uh, in the case of Piston, we needed to accomplish this, and it's what almost all of our engineering team had to do from roughly February through July of this year. And so this is basically going to cover what we had to do to make this work, uh, what the pitfalls were, what the lessons we learned were, and that sort of thing. Uh, just to sort of give you a bit of history, in April of 2013, Piston released 2.0, which was based on Folsom. Uh, this was shortly before I joined the company uh, in May, at which time they had already upgraded the Piston code to Grizzly, uh, so that in August of that year, Piston 2.5 could come out. And at that point, we were actually current with what was released upstream. Uh, Grizzly had come out in April when Piston 2.0 had come out, and then 2.5 followed and brought us up to speed. However, as you can probably guess, Havana was on the horizon. Um, originally, we planned with the next release after Grizzly to continue keeping up with uh, the upstream OpenStack releases. However, at the time when we released 2.5, we decided that there were some other features that we really wanted to focus on, some expanded disk pool support, uh, dashboard improvements, um, multi-region support, that we'd rather focus our resources on getting those features right than necessarily just catching up to Havana. So rather than 3.0 being based on Havana, it was also based off of Grizzly. We ended up releasing 3.0 in February of this year, so 2014, after w at which time Havana was already a reality, uh, and actually was halfway through the release process to Icehouse. I'm also going to stop hitting myself in the microphone battery pack. Um, <laughs> so 3.0 released in February, as I said, and we were already deep in the throes of planning the next release, and there was still that lingering ticket, upgrade to Havana. Who should do that? Should we do it now? Um, there's someone probably in the audience who I will lay all the blame on. He's waving his hand back there frantically, Mr. McGowan, who I think is the person who decided to cross out the word Havana and write the word Ice House in there, since Ice House was due to be released any moment now. So three whatever would not be Havana, we would skip right ahead and base it off of Ice House. So there's that ticket sitting in our system as we're planning the next three dot, whatever it would be, release, 3.5, in case you wanted to skip ahead. Um, and that ticket got assigned to an engineer. Uh, and that engineer's responsibility was to take a couple of days and size it, research it, figure out what was going to happen, and then come back and you know we could actually put it into our planning queue. That engineer, who will remain entirely anonymous for his own benefit, but who is a handsome devil, as I said, was not around when we upgraded from Folsom to Grizzly, and therefore had no first-hand experience doing this. Of course, Christopher had experience, and so did all of our other engineers, so I spoke to all of them, or I should say the anonymous engineer spoke to all of them, and uh, reviewed all of the uh, tickets in our system that pertained to that upgrade from Folsom to Grizzly, and after you know, soul-searching and analysis came up with the estimate one engineer, two weeks, <laughs> Grizzly to ice house. That would be one engineer, <laughs> two weeks, to have all the upstream unit tests, all the piston unit tests, all of Tempest, all of Piston's functional test suite, all working, all passing, and being able to upgrade a running Piston 3.0 Grizzly-based cluster with production workloads to a Piston 3x ice house-based cluster one engineer, two weeks. As you can see, the punishment for my crime is and now I'm here and I have to tell you all about it. Um, <laughs> so let's start with what actually went well. Uh, what went easily, what actually went according to plan. Configurations were simple to migrate. 
we actually we partitioned them off rather than one engineer in two weeks. We handed you know each service out to uh, a different engineer: Nova, Cinder, Glance, Keystone, Horizon, Quantum. Each one migrated the configuration generation portion of our orchestration software, no problem. Made us very optimistic, which was not necessarily the best thing for us to be because we immediately ran into new problems. Um, like I said, the point of a piston release is not to be a monolithic thing that gets installed. I mean, yes, it does install on bare metal, and that's, and, you know, that's the point of piston, but each of our releases is upgradable to the next. That's part of the, the selling story. So we can't just have an ice house release and then sort of make it upgradable. We need to approach it as the upgrade is part of it immediately. Um, so with our configurations in place, we thought, OK, let's just build it and see how well this goes. And yet, we couldn't even build the product yet. Two major reasons we couldn't build the product immediately were migrations and dependencies. The migrations of the configuration files I already talked about, but the migrations I'm talking about now are database migrations, and specifically the OpenStack services, uh, you know, MySQL databases. Um, essentially, what we found was we were skipping a version. We were grizzly to Icehouse, ignoring Havana. And the way that database migrations are mainly handled, uh, release to release, is that you're expected to be able to upgrade from, say, Havana to Icehouse or from Grizzly to Havana, or Folsom to Grizzly, but not to jump generations. And moreover, someone apparently decided that instead of keeping all of these chronologically incremental database migrations separated, it would be much, much easier to squash them down into a very large monolithic database migration. Apparently, this had something to do with speeding up unit tests. I don't know who the culprit exactly was on that one. But uh, the point being that this streamlining actually compressed all of the migrations into one code path. And in the process of doing so, they decided to optimize the logic and actually lost certain steps of it. So when we went back to try to tease out exactly the differences between Grizzly and Icehouse, we found that not only were we having to pull apart this monolithic migration to just to get 22% of it, the last two steps, but that there were pieces missing in between. Uh, and so that process, which we expected might take a day or two, actually took an order of magnitude longer uh, and was the first thing we ran into and the first sort of red flag that went up and said, this is going to take longer than that estimate of one engineer, two weeks. Getting past migrations, the only other thing that was holding us up from actually creating a build and deploying it, testing it, was library dependencies. This is a bit of a cheap shot, but does anybody see the problem with this line? This was, as of Stable Icehouse last summer, a valid dependency in Keystone. It's also a logical fallacy, and like I said, it's a cheap shot, but it was there, and it was one of the many dependency things we had to rationalize. Uh, we try not to pin dependency versions. Um, we try to have all of our uh, services, both OpenStack services and other ser services that we deploy in our clouds, uh, they all need to play nice together. Our hyper-converged architecture means that every single service is running on every single node in a cloud. And so to do that, they all have to use the same runtime environment. They all need to use the same libraries. And it's always an exercise for us to make sure that every single service is able to share dependencies and not collide with each other. In this case, Keystone collided with itself um, in a sort of microcosm of what we were trying to avoid. Um, so rationalizing all of the dependencies, given that all of the OpenStack services were independently um, you know, developed, was a time-consuming task and one that uh, hopefully is made easier now that we have things like the Oslo consolidation of, of uh, common functionalities. Um, the, this is the part where I'm going to uh, refer back to those of you who think we'll just stay with the current uh, system and everything will be fine. Uh, there is currently, or at least as of last week before I got on a plane, a dependency in Keystone that requires a Juno library or the unit tests don't work. That's the Icehouse Keystone requires a Juno library or the unit tests won't work. So even if you're staying current, dependencies are still, for some reason, a boondoggle that we constantly have to tease apart. Um, 
so I mentioned the Oslo consolidation of, of uh, features, and we absolutely applaud that uh, design decision. We think that's fantastic. Um, however, in yet another sort of, you know, cheap shot to the it, it, re re reminiscent of the Keystone one, this change, Oslo dot Sphinx to Oslo Sphinx cropped up right in the middle of what we were doing. And yes, it's easy, and it was fixed upstream, but I just wanted to, <laughs> you know, uh, one more thing we had to deal with was all of a sudden, oh, look, this is going to break. Um, Oslo itself is actually pretty good, but uh, Oslo messaging gave us the biggest problem in rationalizing these dependencies and also just getting this cluster to work. Because once we could get Oslo messaging installed, we found that it didn't have features that the previous iteration pre-Oslo, the Nova messaging, uh, did contain. Um, essentially, is everyone familiar with the uh, piston parable of the puppies and the cows? Okay, let me give you the brief version of it then. Um, coined by one of our co-founders, or one of our founders, Josh McKenzie, essentially, uh, you can treat your servers as puppies or cows. If you treat them as puppies, it, you give them names, and it takes several people to take care of them, and if they get sick, it's extremely expensive. If you treat them like cows, you can have lots of them, they're numbered. If one of them gets sick, you shoot it in the head, and a couple of people can take care of hundreds of them while drinking whiskey. That is the puppies and cows analogy. And that's how we tell our customers to treat their hardware, but we at Piston also treat our services and our software the same way. And so with all of the services running on all of the machines, we need to be able to migrate services, move them around, and not particularly care where they are or what they're doing. We use RabbitMQ for a lot of the message handling, but we've got it everywhere, and if we need to do a node evacuation, we need to migrate that service to another machine. We just kill Rabbit off. Any messages running on that machine that were either in the local queue or were just in flight, they get dropped on the floor. It's our opinion that any network traffic handler of any kind should ex anticipate that certain things are just never going to make it to their destinations and handle it gracefully. At the time we were doing our upgrade from Grizzly to Icehouse, Oslo Messaging did not do that. The reason we ran into this and had a hard time finding it is because Nova Grizzly actually did handle that fine. And so we had been relying on the behavior from Nova in Grizzly and not expecting that it would regress in Oslo messaging. Uh, this, uh, again, this is sort of the grand prize of the conversation. This is the big deal. Uh, Oslo messaging took more developer hours to find it, fix it, and try to get it upstreamed, which we didn't end up doing, uh, than any other single thing we had to do from Grizzly to Icehouse. This was the big boondoggle. Um, and we actually, we did try to get the the fix moved back into Oslo messaging, and actually the argument over whether or not our fix was valid took so long that the deadline for patches to hit Icehouse expired during the conversation. So uh, couldn't quite get that in there. Uh, this was it. This was the big deal. Um, now, I mentioned the Oslo to Oslo Sphinx naming thing uh, in conjunction with this, and uh, people may or may not have heard the the I think it's Phil Carlton uh, may have said it, uh, that there are two hard problems in computer science, cache and validation, naming things, and off by one errors. Uh, we didn't have any cache and validation problems, and we, did, we didn't have our own naming problems. The Oslo Sphinx was one, but if you heard me earlier list off the six OpenStack services that we upgraded, you may have noticed that the last one I said was Quantum. When we released Piston 3.0 based on Grizzly, it included a service called Quantum. When Quantum was renamed to Neutron during the Havana development cycle, we didn't necessarily absorb that change right away. Several reasons for that, one of which is that our release schedule was just not as uh, rapid and iterative as uh, could accommodate that. And second of all, it was working for us, uh, <laughs> so you know, why change it? Um, Eventually, when 3.0 did end up shipping, when we had to massage certain um, things, especially behaviors in Horizon, um, we ended up with the quantum service, the Neutron client, and uh, some special error handling in Horizon because there were quantum, quantum client exceptions and Neutron client exceptions depending upon which code path things were going through. And no, they didn't subclass each other. Uh, 
so what did we do? What do we need? How do we get Neutron service installed? We punt that down the road and worry about the upgrade to Havana ticket, which is now the upgrade to Icehouse ticket, which is, again, one engineer, two weeks. So Quantum needs to become Neutron. We have to tease out all of those exception differences that we found in Horizon. We need to put the new service in place. We need to remove the old quantum service. All fairly straightforward, nothing too tricky there. Uh, one thing we did learn about this, though, uh, that we could apply to future development was that our entire QA and CI system expected there to be a service called quantum. It did not know anything about Neutron. And moreover, it expected that that quantum service would be there all the time. So when we switched from quantum to neutron, we had to essentially add some flexibility into those two systems to be able to accommodate clouds that are this old and have quantum, clouds that are newer and have neutron. Um, and that was just something we hadn't anticipated, so it took more time. Uh, we have, at this point, gone way beyond one engineer and two weeks, but I will continue to beat myself up over that for probably the rest of my career. <laughs> As, and Chris approves of that. Uh, so that gives us the Neutron service, but what do we do about the Neutron network? Uh, in 3.0, with our quantum service, our default network that we uh, distributed to our customers, who were, of course, free to use whatever plugin they wanted to, was Open vSwitch. Now, the reason we ended up with Open vSwitch is because, again, to, to sort of belabor the point of every service on every node, that's how a piston cl uh, cloud works, uh, we needed network service that could be um, distributed in that model. And during the time of the Folsom to Grizzly development cycle, we had read a blueprint upstream about multi-host open vSwitch. And this sounded perfect to us. We liked it. We liked it quite a bit. Unfortunately, the decision was made to punt the work of that off onto the Havana release cycle, and we were trying to release a product based on Grizzly. So we took the blueprint for multi-host OVS, and we cobbled together our own version of it. It worked, it functioned, it met the you know, specifications. Uh, and our assumption was, once Havana lands and we upgrade to Havana, because that ticket still existed, we could take the upstream multi-host OVS, swap it in, get rid of our piece, and everything would be copacetic. Uh, so our Grizzly 3.0 product went out with multi-host OVS. Unfortunately, the work for actually making multi-host OVS work in that Havana timeframe didn't meet up with where we needed it to be when we were developing 3.5 and then, again, skipping over Havana and going into Icehouse. We did a lot of investigation, um, contemplated just forward porting all of this existing sort of you know, non-standard, non-canon OVS code, and ultimately decided to just scrap it. Uh, and this was where we could take advantage of one uh, sort of beneficial side effect of we have, or we had at the time, we've continued to have uh, for over a year now, had one developer more or less entirely uh, focused on open contrail contribution. And open contrail could easily, could, I don't want to say easily, but open contrail could replace OVS as our default uh, networking plugin for Neutron. And you know we have a dedicated resource to it. We already have uh, you know uh, community involvement. We've worked very closely with Juniper on a lot of things in that regard. So we were pretty confident that we could make this work. There were some idiosyncrasies uh, when we had initially done our Contrail development work for our 3.0 product, Grizzly-based. Open Contrail was focused on Havana. So we had actually done a lot of backporting Havana code to work in our Grizzly system. And now we were looking at potentially forward porting certain things into Icehouse because Contrail wasn't yet ready for Icehouse. In fact, they told us that they wouldn't be ready until July. This, at this point, this one engineer two week endeavor has gotten to about the April May timeframe, and we wanted to release in June. So July for Open Contrail meant that this was going to, Open Contrail wasn't going to work any better than Open vSwitch would. However, we had the relationship with Juniper, we had our dedicated resource, we had um, made the decision to get rid of OVS, so we decided to stick with Contrail. And as it turned out, the timing didn't matter at all, because if any of you have followed along with the piston release cycle, 3.5 actually shipped in September, just two months ago, um, which is after July, for those of you who are calendar challenged, and we didn't have to worry about that timing problem at all. Um, why did it take until September? Because of everything I've already spoken about and a couple of more things that I haven't covered yet. So now we've gotten quantum to neutron. 
We have five more OpenStack services. We've gotten through the migrations and the dependencies. All we have to do is get those five services up and running, and we have upgraded Grizzly to Icehouse. As you can probably tell, we are in the home stretch here. But we're not out of the woods. I'm mixing metaphors like a professional. Five more OpenStack services. Glance. Glance is my favorite OpenStack service. I'll tell you exactly why, and you can probably guess. We had no problem whatsoever upgrading Grizzly, Ice, Grizzly to Icehouse using Glance. Uh, I gave this slide a cat eye specifically for Mr. Mark Washenberger, who is my personal hero in this regard. Cinder. Cinder, almost as good as Glance. We had exactly one problem with Cinder, and frankly, it was our own fault. Uh, the logic of the Piston Cloud Boot system is such that when it is bringing a cluster up and running into becoming a cloud, it makes a whole bunch of assumptions about which things should happen in what order. Uh, this is based on you know, our experience, uh, and, but it's also based on some <sighs> cavalier choices. And in the pre-3.5 land, uh, we had made the decision to configure Cinder before we brought up the RBDs that it was aware of. And Grizzly Cinder was extremely forgiving about this. It would just accept its configuration and run, and then as soon as we needed something and it was actually available, everything worked. Icehouse Cinder, much more strict. It validates its configuration immediately, and if we didn't have our RBDs up, Cinder fell on the floor. So Cinder made us be a little more honest in our cloud boot process. Now we provision our disks, and then we bring up Cinder. Horizon, also pretty functionally complete, pretty hands-off as far as uh, any changes that we needed to make or any difficulties that we had, really. Uh, in 3.0, in our Grizzly release, we had done an extensive amount of work on the dashboard itself. Uh, we tend to have the belief that a non-responsive web dashboard in 2014 is kind of ridiculous. Uh, it's sort of you know, de rigueur. It should just be there. Um, so we had done a lot of work on the dashboard to make it appealing to the eye and responsive to the user, more intuitive as far as the uh, flow of actions were concerned. And so when it came time to go Grizzly to Icehouse, mostly what we had to do was just bring it up to speed. Um, the benefit of the fact that it was easy and the fact that everything else was really hard was that uh, we have a couple of really uncompromising UX people at Piston, and they got to basically spend a lot of that time really fine-tuning what they had done in 3.0 uh, to make the Piston 3.5 dashboard, uh, in my entirely biased and utterly subjective opinion, uh, to be pretty much the best-looking dashboard in OpenStack and really what all OpenStack dashboards should look like. Keystone. Um, there's an engineer back in San Francisco. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Uh, about a year and a half ago, he got a job with Piston right out of college, and his very first assignment was to make multi-region with a federated backend work in Grizzly Keystone. And oh, by the way, you've got about a month to do this. And he's never touched anything authentication before. Um, <laughs> I think he still hates me for it, but I think he hates Chris more. Um, he dove right in. Uh, he read every blueprint he could find. He basically lived in the IRC channel, lurked everywhere. Um, Termi would stop by our office. He would pick his brain on various topics. Uh, he, he went zero to expert in authentication and authorization. I was, it was amazing to watch. Ultimately, what he did for Grizzly and our 3.0 product was to put together a federated backend based on those blueprints, based on the feedback that he'd gotten, but uh, sort of filling in the gaps of things that weren't already there in Grizzly. And then when he was done with that, he said, never make me touch Keystone again, please, or I will die. <laughs> Guess who got assigned fixing Keystone for our Grizzly to Icehouse upgrade? <laughs> Essentially, we, we had to tell him, we need you to take everything you just did, tear it all out, and rebuild it for Icehouse. Um, we ended up making some different design decisions the second time around uh, in how to handle federation. Um, he, we actually we sent him to Atlanta to the design summit, and he you know, followed the entire Keystone track and came back thinking, I know exactly how we want to do federation, and then we had some design discussions, and 
we had to break his heart. So he soldiered through this, and uh, his reward for finishing that was getting an even more nasty assignment after that that is not part of this discussion, but he's a trooper. Uh, Keystone finally did get put together, um, and our uh, multi-region, multi-driver backend uh, worked out just fine. Which brings us to Nova, and Nova is obviously the service without which there are no clouds, right? Um, Nova is, you know, the heart and soul of this whole thing, and uh, obviously near and dear to, to folks at Piston and to all of us here. Uh, Nova was generally well-behaved for us um, in and of itself. Uh, the, the thing that we ran into with Nova essentially is maybe Piston specific or at least specific to a subset of use cases of OpenStack of which Piston is one. And that is that all of our migrations and all of our uh, VM operations are done with these live production workloads, running clusters, customer data is in play, and we need to have these things work automatically without downtime. And that includes migrating VMs from machine to machine. It includes things like what we were trying to do with this upgrade, where we were actually um, trying to freeze VMs with libvirt, upgrade QMU in place, and then restart the VMs, except now QMU is offering a different ROM version than the one that the VM had registered in its XML. And the fact that apparently Nova nor anything else could really edit that XML on a live running VM combined with the fact that some of that XML was generated by system config, and if system config changed and decided that it wanted to give different information, it couldn't update the XML, and it was a very large knot of XML craziness that we needed to untangle to be able to get these VMs to behave the way we wanted to. Uh, we really wanted to get the upgraded QMU in place, and that was a uh, subject of quite a lot of discussion, quite a lot of hair pulling, uh, people pulling their own hair, not each other's. Uh, to figure out how to make that work. And ultimately, we had to do what I've already said we prefer not to do. Uh, we don't like to pin dependencies. We don't like to tie ourselves to specific versions of things. But in the case of Nova, what we ended up needing to do was we can freeze the VM, we can upgrade QMU, but we need to pin the ROM versions within QMU to the ones that we already have. That way, when the VM comes back up, it doesn't fall on the floor. What does that mean? That means we're punting that decision, that we're punting that problem down the road just as we had previously done with Grizzly to Havana and Grizzly to Icehouse decisions. We'll, we'll worry about that when Havana lands. We'll worry about that when Icehouse lands. Well, this is a, an issue where we're going to worry about the ROM versions when we worry about the ROM versions. For now, we'll pin them. Everything else about Nova will work. We'll get the new QMU. We'll get the new Libvirt and Cobalt and everything. Which brings me to my very last slide. Uh, I said at the beginning, one engineer, two weeks. That was my estimate. And when it comes time to deal with this problem that we have punted down the road, one engineer, me, two weeks, on vacation. That'll be it. Thank you very much. That's uh, our upgrade from Grizzly to Ice House Odyssey. I uh, hope that it was enlightening and a great amount of schadenfreude for you all. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>